Hello and welcome. I can hear myself okay. Give the wife a second here. Happy birthday, wife. Hope you like the park. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about this in the poll, but I have actually been to Zion and it is wonderful. I was there with my wife, actually, uh, twice. All right, we'll give everyone a second to get things settled in here. Let's flip over. So we're just a little bit to the southwest of Zion. And uh, we'll start by doing a little bit of a climb here. Get our way out. All right, double thumbs up. Look at that. Okay. So, got someone materializing on me. Uh, so I'll kick off with a little bit of info about the stream while people get settled. So each week we pick a new national park to explore together. And this week we're exploring Zion National Park. Those of you with a copy of Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, I've uploaded the flight plan today for you to follow along. If you don't have a copy of it, there's another link uh, for the uh, to follow along on a web browser of any kind. So let me post those two up real quick. And I know, uh, as it <laughs> surprising or not, uh, Fractals and I both also have the rest of our life that we do. So I believe Fractals is uh, is held up on something as well. So we'll see if he's able to join later. All right, here's that flight plan coming. And I am in a uh, Savage Cub with a few clouds, and it's about noon. The time doesn't uh, super matter, but I'll go back a little bit in time. Noon local time-ish. Brings out the shadows and the hills a little bit better. And then, like I mentioned, if you don't have Microsoft Flight Simulator, but you'd like to follow along, this is a good way to do that. And so that's the same technology I use to uh, stream to the iPad here. All right, so I've researched the park in preparation and added any new information with sources to the Wikipedia page. So why Wikipedia? There's two reasons. It's a way to make sure the facts are checked by others, and it's a way to give back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour here. So to that end, if you notice anything incorrect or that could be better clarified, um, please help fix the Wikipedia pages. As the Wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. We'll also vote near the end on the next national park we want to explore together. So look out for that and other posts coming in the chat. Um, I'll make sure that I'm looking over so anything, uh, thoughts, ideas, questions, whatever you want to throw out there. Um, this comes up from time to time, but I do a lot more research about the park than we have time for in the hour. But if you're interested about a particular topic, I love talking about whatever. So uh, feel free to throw it out. Little disclaimer, uh, yes, I'm a pilot, but we'll be taking full advantage of the simulator. So don't try this at home. All right, without further ado, I'm Jules Altis and I'll be your pilot this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore Zion National Park. And I will do my takeoff roll here. I mentioned this before, but I'm not a uh, tail dragger pilot, so hopefully I can keep on the runway a little bit. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Fractals. <laughs> oh man. Good stuff. Fractal says that he spent five minutes trying to figure out why the sound wasn't working just to realize that his headphones were plugged in the whole time. A classic snafu. Yeah, so for and Flying Sing, I don't know if you uh if you were able to get the game working, but I'm gonna climb out a little bit here uh, and do kind of a proper pattern departure. Watching those clouds. That's where that pilot's license comes in. I avoid flying in the cloud. Okay. Uh, so while I'm getting set up here, uh, I mentioned that we'll be flying a Piper uh, Savage Cup. It's a pretty classic bush plane high wing. It's a, actually a very fun plane to fly. Short takeoffs and, and good climb rates. Um, a small administrative update just for uh, for those of you who do have the game, I would highly recommend getting the scenery by Jepson2001, I believe is his name. Or, or screen name um, for Zion. It's a significantly better version of uh, what Zion looks like. So can't recommend that enough. It's a little bit big, and I do worry that it might slow down my computer while we're streaming today. So we'll uh, we'll see how it's going. Hopefully, it's not too too choppy because it's high resolution, but it's also very pretty. All right, and with that, Fractal's now the master of the audio. Uh, do you mind posting up the park bowl? And, uh, and while Fractals does that, so the purpose of Zion National Parks, this is from the park purpose statement, again, that foundation document that all the parks have. 
The purpose of Zion National Park is to preserve the dramatic geology, including Zion Canyon, and a labyrinth of deep and brilliant colored Navajo sandstone canyons formed by extraordinary processes of erosion at the margin of the Colorado Plateau. That was a whole sentence of things. We will talk about all of those different things tonight. So Navajo sandstone, uh, the canyons formed by the extraordinary erosion process, Colorado Plateau, good three ones to remember. To safeguard the, uh, this, it's a very long park purpose statement um, and very flowery, I guess I would say. Um, so the second part to it, and to safeguard the park's wilderness character and its wild and scenic river values, to protect evidence of human history, and to provide for scientific research and enjoyment of, in the enjoyment and enlightenment of the public. All right, there you go. Thanks, Fractal. So the the poll for this one, um, kind of standard. Have you been to the park in the last ten years? Uh, have you been once upon a time, or have you never been? And I have been to Zion National Park. Uh, I can probably give a little bit of of the the story on when I went to Zion. So my wife and I got married. Uh, we'll say in the last ten years. Um, and we did our, uh, kind of a big trip out there just before our wedding, uh, out to Zion, which is a really fun place to go, to go visit. Um, and so we both liked it a lot. We went and visited the Grand Canyon as well. There's a, a loop that you can do. Um, but it was a little bit too, a little bit too foggy to see. We went in the winter just before the snow was lining. All right, let's see. Four votes for yes in the last 10 years, and then three votes for not yet. All right. Uh, so a lot of people who have been there sort of recently it's kind of fun Oop, it's a little bit choppy on my end i think that uh it's probably coming through in the stream if it becomes a lot then i'll uh i'll look into reducing some of the graphics or, or some other options we have and then again it may uh it may come across fine on the stream so uh, let me know in the in the chat if it's too distracting all right let me pop out here You start to see the Navajo sandstone off in the distance. Okay, so that's a park purpose. Um, I have a special treat for everyone today that I'm actually pretty excited about. I uh, emailed the National, the Zion National Park Forever Project, which is a nonprofit that's uh, working on uh, preserving Zion National Park, and requested to do a screening of some part of their Zion National Park video. So this is one. Uh, it's not a national park video like I would normally do. It's a little bit um, more uh, produced, I guess I would say. It's very, very well done. Um, I'll play the last uh, about seven or eight minutes of the of the video. It's about 22 minutes long, so I'll post the whole thing to the Discord afterwards uh, for anyone who'd like to watch it. But um, it's a really good overview of, of some of the fun parts of the park. Uh, things to look for in this are uh, pictures and, and images of Zion, because that's a really really cool part to see, as well as the um, kind of the canyons and the river and the a lot of the natural elements that aren't going to show up in the in the game quite the same. Um, that's that's what to look out for. Yeah, Fractals. Uh, Fractals was actually there with me and Zion, so that was two years ago. Holy cow. Man, I would have said two months ago if you'd asked me. Anyway, um, okay. Let me pull up this. Uh, let me pull up this video. Fractals. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Oops. Let me flip over here. Let me know in the audio for the video too. Canyoneering is kind of like going into a history book. And it gives you a really neat and overarching view of the geology and the formation of the area. Each layer in Zion holds a different secret. And being able to interact with that in such an intimate space as a canyon gives you a completely different view of the canyon as this very personal and historic place. On road. Zion is the most impressive exposure of Navajo sandstone in the world. But water carved these canyons, and that process hasn't stopped. 
there's a power that moves through these canyons and flash floods are a deadly reality. And for us, it's about understanding and respecting that process. Going into canyons is kind of like going into the arteries of the earth. Where water flows, energy also flows. You're in these places where it's really narrow. It's easy to forget that it radiates until you come into a place where you can, you can touch the wall, you know, you can touch both of the walls. It's cool to be able to travel through that space and travel through that energy while being like the thing that moves through that place, being like water. Water is very powerful. Water can take life, but it, it can also give life. Water has a significant piece in our culture because we're high desert people. And here in Zion National Park, just like any other places here in our traditional land, there just isn't a lot of water except for this river that runs through it. For us, the goodness of water is that it gives life. Everything is connected. Everything has life. It just lives differently than we do. Our belief is everything that was created here, plants and animals, the rocks, had a life like us at one time and that they could understand the Paiute language. That's why the language is so important for us to retain. Paiute people have this inherent responsibility to care for the land. We're tied to the land. Our culture is tied to the land. So if the land goes away and the land is mismanaged or misused, then our culture goes away. Both of my parents taught me from when I was little that my ancestors connect me to this place. When I come here, I think of all of the stories my parents told me. And I want to make sure that my kids know where they come from. Zion helps me know who I am from my history and my people. As parents, I think it's very important for us to convey our traditions to our children, and they always see that as a significant part of their life, that they're able to pass it on to their children. And we live on forever. Zion is very special. It's not just the beauty of the walls or the sound of the river. It's something magical, something different, something unlike I feel in other places. With all the people coming in, I think every one of them can find their own story in Zion. This place is so precious, and it's our job to try to make sure that it's protected forever. When you think about what you can do to be a steward of the national park, people often think really large scale, but it can be very, very simple things. Every little action, if replicated over many people, will have a really large impact worldwide. Whether you, you come to the park every day or whether you visit it once, let it take hold of you. Let it have some say on how you operate in the world. I think that only when we personally connect with a place do we truly gain the power to protect it. That's the whole point, is to protect this place, not just for us here today, but for future generations forever.
pretty cool, right? I gotta take these uh, near myself so I can. Um, if for those of you who haven't been yet, the the images they captured at that were were pretty pretty accurate for it. But there's something much like a lot of the national parks, like Glacier or Yosemite, or those the really grand sort of um, walking into a canyon feel is is hard to explain. Um, and we're about to actually fly. Uh, we're right over Rockville now, which is a, a town nearby. Uh, and then we'll be entering the canyon. It seems to be evening out on my end, at least enough to to keep the the scenery on. You can see the kind of uh, pinkish tone to the rocks in the distance. That's where the the nice scenery starts. Yeah, fractals. I I agree. And actually, the the rest of the video talks about the different the different people who you saw at the end. It was kind of a summary. I'm like the lady from Japan. It talks about her um, journey to Zion and what it means to her and why and that kind of thing. Uh, it, it's a pretty good movie. Yeah, uh, Nublados Trace and Sailor Guy agree. It's a beautiful place, a good movie, good capture of it. All right, so here we are flying into the actual first part of the canyon. Let me pull up a couple of quick pictures so you can see. This is the area around, which is a little bit south of where we are, but this is sort of what it looks like. So can you imagine living there, right? And then this is the entrance to Zion, uh, sort of. This is like kind of the part. What I really wanted to point out here, though, is the texture of the rocks in the game with the scenery addition is actually pretty accurate. Um, and so at least in the areas where it's pink, you'll see that kind of that texture. And yeah, OK, so we'll flip to a couple of photos as we go through there's a couple of photos. Thank you, Fractals. Okay, so our first topic today is tunnels. And so Fractals posted that poll, give people a second to respond on that. The connection to the park is there's a tunnel along the Zion Mount Carmel uh, Highway, and so, uh, which is that the highway is a 25 mile long road in Southern Utah. The tunnel in the park is 5,600 feet long and it follows the profile of the Pine Creek Canyon. Um, so let me show a picture of it, excuse me. Uh, so it's about, so this is the, the west entrance, looks like this. And then the east entrance looks like that. But the really cool part, I think, is they use galleries to provide light and ventilation in the, in the canyon. So when you're driving through, it's, it's really surreal because every now and then you encounter these sort of like almost cut out holes where you can see into the rest of the valley and get this really cool view. Um, they also use these galleries, I learned while researching this, they use them to just toss out rocks as they were carving out the tunnel, because um, you need to put the rocks somewhere, and so they were just throwing them over. Um, but it used to be that you could park along the galleries, you can't do that anymore, but uh, but they're really cool as you're driving along. So wait, you want someone else to drive into Zion, you don't want to be the driver driving into Zion. A tip for you. Okay, uh, let me flip back here. So that's that's the reason to talk about tunnels is there's this really famous um, kind of marvel of engineering type tunnel uh, in Zion. Quick pan around here. Okay. So we're just coming over the visitor center here now. So this is kind of the first part you would go into the port. All right. So, um, oops. So that poll was, what is a common unit of measurement for assessing tunnel design? Is it the amount of cool artwork per mile? Is it the uh, air changes per hour, or is it the number of famous Hollywood chase scenes hosted? I hope. And <laughs> okay, good, good. So all the votes, uh, we have two votes for the number of famous Hollywood chase scenes hosted, um, which I, I assume is an important uh, measure as well. But the answer this time was air changes per hour. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means, uh, especially when we talk about like, designing a safe tunnel and, and how that would be important. Okay, so what is a tunnel? It's an underground passageway dug through surrounding soil, earth, rock, and enclosed except for an entrance and exit. Commonly, the entrance and exit would be at both ends. So like a couple classic tunnels, I'm, you guys have all seen. <laughs> Fractals kind of got it wrong, yeah. You've all seen tunnels before, I'm sure, but this is sort of an example of one type of tunnel. You might get a little more ornate sort of, sort of thing, depending on where you go. Um, sometimes they're very celebrated. Sometimes they're very, um, very simple. So it may be for foot or vehicular traffic, rail traffic, a canal. Um, often parts of a rapid transit network will be uh, tunnels, like a tunnel system will be involved. You have utility tunnels, uh, telecommunication tunnels, or just passages for people in convenient areas. All right, I'll 
spin her out a little bit so we can enjoy the, the park. I picked two pretty, um, oh, there's that. So this is that road that comes in that I mentioned. This is um, Zion to Mount Carmel Highway. So the the uh, tunnel is actually off in the back there. But you can see it actually in the, this again is the scenery is really good. So you can kind of see what it looks like and the view that you would have coming in. Okay, so you can also have secret tunnels if you want for like military purposes or whatever you need, um, or for wildlife crossings, lots of lots of different reasons. So now that you're so excited about tunnels, what do you need to do if you want to build a tunnel, right? So one of the first things is you want to assess that you can actually build the tunnel where you want to put it. So um, oh, let me quick pan over here. So this is called the Court of the Patriarchs. As it kind of loads in here, you can see. So let me grab a photo of that. I'll pause here. Okay, so that's what the Court of the Patriarchs look like uh, in the real world. Again, the, the scenery is really, really well done. Um, and then this is an Ansel Adams photo of, of this. You may remember uh, Ansel Adams photos come up from time to time in the national parks. Kind of a cool way to capture it. Okay, so that's the Court of the Patriarchs. Let me flip back here. And so you, as a visitor, would be walking along the, the middle part here or taking a bus that goes along that road. This is all of what you'd be seeing. Uh, okay, so, so you want to build a tunnel. The first thing you have to do is make sure that you have assessed that you can actually build your tunnel where you want to. And so a couple things that you're uh, looking for would be information like the uh, stand-up time, which is the amount of time a newly excavated cavity can support itself without uh, additional structures. So if you build a, a snow cave or something like that and it falls down right away or falls down after half an hour, that would be the stand-up time for it. And so that tells you how deep you can get and how long you can spend there before you need to start um, putting up additional support so it doesn't fall on you. Uh, you also got to worry about groundwater control. So where's the water going to come from? Where's it going to go? And is that going to be a problem for your tunnel? And then the last thing that you want to, want to decide is the cross-sectional shape. So you've probably been in uh, uh, circular tunnels, like a foot, foot tunnel or a, a pedestrian tunnel often. Um, a lot of uh, automo uh, ve vehicular excuse me, tunnels are square. And so you have a bunch of different options that you can do there. Um, and it all depends on how you're going to maximize that stand-up time and then the amount of support that you need to put, put into the tunnel to get it to, to stay up. The other thing to consider, and okay, so we're going to have another, I can't remember if I, I just thought this or if I said this, so apologies if I'm repeating myself, but um, I kind of picked, um, I don't want to say easy topics, but topics that are pretty easy to jump in and out of, because this park is gorgeous and I'm going to end up getting distracted um, myself. I was <laughs> I was trying to plan the, the flight and I kept just um, just going all over the place and... and um, I don't know, just exploring uh, kind of what I, what I like to encourage everyone to do. Um, but it's just so pretty. All right, so kind of spiral, spiral, spiraling around here, get myself some elevation change. Um, a fun story while I'm climbing here. I That photo that you may have seen that I use sometimes, it's a picture of me and like a cowboy hat and I have a view of a canyon in the background. That is from this East Mesa trail view. So I can actually turn around real quick here. So that is where that photo comes from, uh, which I would highly recommend. It's a little bit um, off the beaten trail as far as Zion goes. It's not where a lot of people go, um, but but we went and I would, I would recommend it. Okay. So let me pan this thing around so you can kind of see into the canyons. And then we start to get up into the narrows, which is a uh, a fun place. I haven't been able to go to the Narrows yet, but that's on my list. Oh, Fractal. Zion is all electric buses. That's true. Cool. Good on them. I really liked... Um, I think Zion does a good job in general uh, with with their decisions and the way that they support the park. I think, I think it's pretty well done. All right, so you want to build a tunnel, but do you really want a tunnel? Because it may be that you want a bridge if you're trying to go over water or something like that. So typically bridges would be less expensive to build, but if you have things like uh, large ships that need to go through, 
uh, and would require a very large bridge or a drawbridge, then it may be less expensive just to put a tunnel underneath. It also is less disruptive for traffic flows and like um, really big uh, bays or, or harbors would we'd want that kind of thing. Um, the other the other reason you might want a tunnel instead of a bridge, which I hadn't considered, is real estate considerations. So if you put a bridge in, that bridge is going to take up a lot of um, space on the shore that might be really valuable to the city. So a place like Hong Kong or Manhattan uh, would much prefer to have a series of tunnels because the footprint on the land is much lower. And so you can have a short entrance and then you're underwater as opposed to a bridge, which is going to kind of cut through a lot of the, the more expensive places to, to put houses. All right, so I'm going to look down real quick here. This is the Narrows, um, kind of up towards the head. I think it technically goes a little further, but um, you saw a little bit of, of this kind of canyoneering hiking in that video. That's what this is all about, is the, the super narrow kind of view there. Uh, okay, so maybe you're designing a tunnel for Hong Kong, and so yes, you do want to put a tunnel in. The three basic types of tunnels that you would uh, have for options for building it are a cut and cover tunnel, where you essentially build out a shallow trench and then just cover it over when you're done. So this would sort of look like this. They'll often do it for big uh, metro stations that are underground. You just clear all the land out, put your tunnel in, and then put the land back on top. Keep it simple. Another option you can do is a board tunnel. So a board tunnel is constructed without removing the ground above. So this would be like Zion. And so you can use like a tunnel boring machine if you wanted. So this would be one way to carve that kind of thing out. Um, there's a couple other ways that you can, can do for a, a board tunnel. Like if you need to build up support, you can do something called uh, shotcrete, which I had not heard of before. So it's when you shoot concrete out of a hose to add concrete walls to something. Um, so of all the things to, to walk away from tunnels with, the concept that you can shoot concrete at a wall and just have it then build a wall for you uh, is pretty is pretty exciting. I don't know where I get a, a shotcrete uh, hose, but, but I kind of want one now. Um, one other thing I'll mention with tunnels, a lot of the stuff that we talked about with arches comes up all over the place. So they use a lot of the techniques from like a barrel vault, which is the same stuff we talked about with gateway arch. How does an arch work? Right. It's the same sort of support questions. Yeah, callbacks. Okay. Um, and then last but not least, you could do something like an immersed tube tunnel. So this would be like when we were talking about um, if you wanted to put one under a bay or something like that, then you could do something like this. There's a couple of different approaches, but they all roughly the same, which is you have some sort of ventilation tower and then your tunnel goes underneath whatever uh, rock bed or just underneath the sand, depending on how the, the floor looks. All right. Okay, so those are your options for a tunnel. Um, I feel like I would probably do a tunnel, uh, a board tunnel, I think that would be the most fun, especially if I got to use the shotcrete, uh, shotcrete mechanism. All right, so you have your tunnel. Next thing you want to know is, is it safe? Oh, you know what? Um, let me pull up two photos real quick before I forget. So one we passed is called Weeping Rock, which didn't really look like anything in the in the game anyway. But um, this is what this is. So this is supposed to be a very cool place to go and see. I've not been to Weeping Rock. And then the narrows I pointed out as we flew over them. So this is what the narrows looks like if you were going to go hiking there. So you have to hike through water. Um, you have to check to make sure that there's no flash flood warnings or, or watches going on. Um, and so, yeah, so that's that's what the narrows are. Oops, let me make this a little bit bigger. Let's actually see it. Okay. So the last thing you want to make sure is you have a tunnel, but you want to make sure that it's actually safe for people to use. And so the one of the biggest problems you have is of uh, if, for instance, if a fire broke out, you have to deal with the gas and the smoke production, and so because even a low concentration of carbon monoxide can be really toxic, um, this is something actually that comes up a lot when you're learning to fly: is how to detect carbon monoxide poisoning and what to do about it, um, which essentially comes down to open the window is a really good first step. Um, but it's really it's really uh, dangerous for, for humans. And so you need to have your tunnel really well ventilated. They'll do things like ventilation shafts, like I pointed out in the picture, or powered fans just to remove toxic exhaust gases. Um, and that'll be just from cars driving too can, can produce that kind of thing. So that leads back to our poll, which is that that unit of measurement called the air changes per hour. And so that be, is the measure of air volume added or removed from a space in one hour divided by the volume of that space. 
It's a way of measuring how quickly the air is being um, changed within your tunnel um, or within your room or, you know, within whatever. Um, the other thing you can do for tunnel safety is if it's a large tunnel, you might have a 24-hour manned operation center that will monitor and report problems. Um, you can have video surveillance, uh, traffic condition reports. Um, another one that uh, apparently some tunnels will do is just put up um, like live streams that you can view on the internet and see how things are looking there. Kind of fun things to, to go and check out. Oops, let me fly around here. Getting too far off course. Fractal said, uh, so they just shoot concrete at rebar, they lean against the wall. It sounds like fun work, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, that that is my understanding. It's a style of tunnel construction called the New... I want to say New Holland Tunnel or something like that. It's like a very specific style of, of construction where they will typically use uh, shotcrete. Um, yeah, but it does sound like fun, right? <laughs> How do you get that job? Uh... <laughs> all right crazy crazy Tycho says i went into my basement yesterday the beeping from the carbon monoxide really gave me a headache carbon monoxide alarm excuse me really gave me a headache that's funny uh, and terrifying uh if you don't have a carbon monoxide detector by the way it's worth investing in one okay so um, in summary a tunnel is an underground passageway dug through the surrounding soil earth rock and enclosed except for an entrance and exit. Uh, commonly, those entrance and exits will be at each end. To build your tunnel, you want to start by checking the conditions you want to build. Make sure you can actually put a tunnel there. If all looks well, then you can choose basically between a cut and cover tunnel, board tunnel, or an immersed tube tunnel. Once you've decided on that, uh, you need to ensure that your air changes per hour are sufficient, and then you've got yourself a tunnel. So, have fun <laughs> building a tunnel. Uh, Okay, so <laughs> while I was writing this, I was reflecting on a, a thing. Oh, here, let me pull up a quick picture real quick before I, before I jump into this. Um, okay, so this is Kolob Canyon. So this is um, Kolob Canyon and Kolob Canyon Arch. So this is where we're approaching right now. And this doesn't have the, the kind of nice scenery pack, so it's a little bit rougher, but that's what it looks like. And then there's an arch that you can't see in the game, but is is halfway through here. That is this um, really incredible. I think it's the largest one in the. It might be the largest in the world. Um, I should have that written down already. Um, but it's a, a an incredible arch to go and see in, in the real world. So um, that's like straight ahead of us right now, but you don't see it in the game. Okay. Oh, last one actually. This is the subway in Colab Canyon. Um, another reason for uh, tunnels this week, by the way, is the subway, like it's talked about here. So this is uh, a kind of a short section, but it's really famous with photographers because it's got this um, really stunning movement in it. Right, so that's where we're flying in now, is this Colo Canyon. Okay, so I was, I was researching tunnels and I was reflecting on um, when I was a freshman in college and my buddies and I got together and we decided that we were going to come up with a very clever system for uh, m basically moving between rooms in the dorm. We we're all in the dorm together, right? And it wasn't like malicious or anything. We were just a bunch of engineers with like way too much time on our hands, I guess. Um, and so we were kind of, kind of scoping out, okay, so what would it look like if we decided to do this? And so the idea we came up with was we're going to install a series of tunnels between the different rooms, right? And that would let us then go from one room to the next, um, as you know, whatever we wanted, basically. And then the other thing we could do is, so we have these tunnels going between rooms, and then we could put in slides out the window. So you could go tunnel between one room, or you could do a, like a tunnel slide into another room. And so you get this like, you know, uh, basically McDonald's play place set up going, where you have kind of this elaborate network of tunnels, and you have these slides going around. Um, and then we were talking about it's like, okay, but you probably want some privacy on your on your tunnel because you don't just want freestanding tunnels and so we say, okay well then we'll have to put some like kind of barrier in front of the tunnel um, we could put the same sort of thing in the entrance of the slide or something and we'll figure it out um, and then we realized we need some way to get back up the slides and so we said okay well then we'll put some sort of like stairs we'll have slides on one side and stairs on the other side or some kind of combination like that and pretty soon as we started to get in the details it, we realized that we 
just basically designed a system of hallways and uh, and stairwells for a building. So all of our genius engineering resulted in this, um, what was basically already, you know, like the doors we had in our rooms and the hallways that were the, the tunnels. Um, it's pretty sick. So um, all that to say, sure, you can call your hallway a hallway if you want, or you can think of it as a highly evolved tunnel. And then you, the genius human that you are, have conquered the problem of getting between two rooms without having to go outdoors. So congrats. <laughs> uh, this is the, the culmination of a lot of hours of, of thinking. You wanted that, so. Okay. Um, but let me see, I'll check the chat. Oh, Emerson says the Narrows is a similar looking subway too. Cool. I didn't I didn't know that. That kind of like uh water flows and carves out. You can see that same thing we talked about with um uh rivers actually where it kind of carves around the bend. You see that really strongly here. Oh, thank you, Fractals. Uh longest arch is in uh landscape arch at Arches National Park, I believe. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so my <laughs> bad joke about hallways basically being like highly evolved tunnels. So you're welcome. Uh, okay, Fractals, you want to post up that next poll? Save me from my terrible joke. I think my favorite one, my favorite stream moment that I didn't realize until afterwards was in um, Yo, uh, excuse me, Yosemite. I had written some joke and I remember writing it and going, this isn't super funny. Um, but like at some point I don't have, you know, you have a better joke, so you're going to go with it. Um, and, uh, my iPad was, was doing this thing where it would announce whenever the plane was descending too rapidly. So it would go sync rate, sync rate, sync rate. Um, some of you probably remember that. And I was telling this joke and it was obviously not going to land. Like you could hear it in the back of my head. I could hear it wasn't going to land. Um, and then the iPad starts going sync rate, sync rate, sync rate. So it was a rough, it was a rough one, but good to laugh about. All right, thanks, Fractal. So, uh, where did the layers of the Grand Staircase come from? So our second topic today is the Grand Staircase, uh, and also uh, one to answer on the the poll. But also, have has anyone heard of the Grand Staircase already? Because this was totally new to me uh, when I started researching this. Give me one second here. All right, so the answers for that poll on the Grand Staircase is it deposits of sedimentary rock from different environmental conditions over about 240 million years, or generations of organisms dying and getting buried, or Earth trying to show off for its secret crush, Venus. Give her a second to vote on that. Okay, so yes, we're talking about a Grand Staircase. And do I mean this kind of grand staircase, which is what pops up when you search grand staircase? That is not what I mean, although this is a great grand staircase to keep in mind. What I really mean is this grand staircase. And so this is the way that uh, scientists and the people in the, in the field describe the various parks around the Colorado Plateau. So you can kind of see it in here, and I'll show about three different versions of this image because I think some of them will resonate with different people depending on how you soak up information. Um, we'll see. All right. Uh, oh, M. Rosno, it's cool to see the layers change over the plateau. Yeah. Now, now that I know about this, I really want to go and, and just go exploring for those. Grand staircases and leveled up always. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> no no blood dose. Trace caught onto the, it's like a very house theme today, grand staircase and, and hallways and stuff. It's fine. Uh, okay, Fractal says the uh, pole is broken. That's too bad. Maybe that'll be a good one to research for next week and go find some better solutions. All right, so what I wanted to point out in this grand staircase, you'll see that they label where Bryce Canyon is, and then Zion Canyon's right here. Then as you move over to the right, uh, there's a couple other uh, national parks that they don't label on this one, but they have in others. And then at the far right, you get to the Grand Canyon, which cuts way down into the layers here. So I'll zoom back out so you can kind of see the big picture again. But you'll notice that there's this sort of um, bend. Oops. 
Oh, cool. Thanks. Uh, so it just fractals it just worked the second time. Nice. Uh, okay, yeah. So three votes for the sedimentary rocks over three years. Uh, one vote on the organisms dying and getting buried, and then two votes on the secret crush. It was a secret crush. All good answers, though. Um, so the uh, yeah the answer is the uh, sedimentary layers over about two two hundred and forty million years, and how they represent the environmental conditions is one of the really interesting parts to scientists because it tells them a lot about what life was like there uh, during that time. So, so all right, well, let me pull up another picture. So. Uh, okay, so uh, so the reason that Grand Staircase is really useful is that we have all these different layers. So in Zion, these are the ones, there's that Navajo sandstone that was mentioned a little earlier, that red rock. But you can see all these different layers that show up that are all different parts of the Grand Staircase. Um, so I'll show, I'll, I have a couple other Grand Staircase pictures that I'll put up, but um, we'll do it over time. Uh, awesome mountain biking out there. Worthy Dr. Funk, I'm guessing, which I very much appreciate your name. Um, I have not been mountain biking in the Zion area, but that does sound like a blast. Uh, there's a big Red Bull circuit, actually. When I was flight planning, it was like there was a notification to be to, to look for the Red Bull competition so you don't accidentally fly over something where they're like actively doing... Um, aerobatic sports or or i think mountain biking too is one of them so um we flew over it at the very beginning it was the the like entryway to the the red bull circuit so, um so in other words uh worthy dr funk i am i'm jealous that seems like a blast you want biking out there okay so grand staircase let me read you the actual description of this as we fly through this cloud it's an immense sequence of sedimentary rock layers that stretch south from bryce canyon national park and uh, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument through Zion National Park and then into the Grand Canyon National Park. So all those ones I pointed out on that map. In the 1970s, uh, geologist Clarence Dutton first conceptualized this region as a huge stairway descending from the bottom of the Grand Canyon northward uh, with the cliff edge of each layer forming giant steps. Button divided this layer cake of earth history, cute little phrase, layered cake of earth history into five steps from the youngest to the oldest rocks. So he called them the pink cliffs, the gray cliffs, the white cliffs, the vermilion cliffs, and the chocolate cliffs. And I will pull up two photos. We're coming up on lava point here. That's okay. Um, so here are the pink cliffs. So this is from Bryce Canyon. So we'll go to Bryce Canyon uh, some future week. And then there's the gray cliffs. I couldn't find a really good photo of the gray cliffs, I believe it's this middle layer here, but for some reason the other ones were really easy to identify, and this one is, is a little trickier. Uh, but I think that's the right one. This is what the white cliffs look like. And the white cliffs actually exist in Zions. This is what they look like there. It's part of the great white throne you can see on the top. And then vermilion cliffs would be the next kind of set of layers. So that's what those look like. And then last but not least, you have your chocolate cliffs. This is from Capitol Reef National Park, which we will also go to at some future day. All right, so there's his five layers. Um, modern geologists label, um, I can't remember, like 25 or so more layers. So it's a, a lot more complicated than that. But I like that kind of breakdown because um, then we can look at something like this and try and pick out it's a, a rather small image, but I think we can make it work. So this one was the one that resonated with me, actually, because you can really see the stair steps, and it highlights that there's this kind of curve. So the Grand Canyon comes back up, but the layers over here are um, newer layers, even though the Grand Canyon uh, rises in elevation. Okay, so there's your, your steps. Uh, this is A, B, across it goes. Grand Canyon is A, Chocolate Cliffs, B, Vermilion Cliffs, C, White Cliffs, uh, D, Zion Canyon is E, and you'll notice that Zion Canyon cuts into the cliff here, and that's part of the reason that it's such a, a pretty unique place to go. And then Bryce Canyon is, uh, oops, is over on the right here. So this is, I'm sorry, uh, G is the pink cliffs and then Bryce Canyon is H. So we are here in Zion. And so with that image in mind, and, and if remember how it's kind of cut into the sandstone. So now we're about 10,000 feet above Zion Canyon. The big old cloud in our way. Right, here's what we're going to do. And now when you look out, you can see kind of Zion, and as we leave the park, it'll, it'll become more apparent. 
um, is just this canyon that cuts right into the stone, just like you saw in that picture. Pretty cool place to, pretty, pretty cool place on Earth, actually. Once you know what you're looking for, you can pick it out from, uh, from space pretty, pretty readily. Uh, okay. Okay, so we talked about the Grand Staircase. So how do these all relate to the different parks? So there's the oldest exposed formation in Zion National Park, and the formation would be that kind of general layer. The oldest exposed formation in Zion is the youngest exposed formation in Grand Canyon. And that that one is uh, about 240 million year old uh, Kaibab limestone. Also, I'm realizing I got the poll question wrong then because I misread this information originally. So. The formations date back further than 240 million years. Um, okay, so the oldest formation in Zion is the youngest in Grand Canyon. And then the oldest... Um, yep, the oldest in Zion, then the formations just above that are where Bryce Canyon continues. So if you go and visit Bryce Canyon, and then go and visit Zion, and then go and visit the Grand Canyon, you've covered the whole range of the Grand Staircase and all those different layers. There's a bunch of other parks scattered in between that capture different parts. Um, so if you go and do a big tour of the area, which is another great way to explore that part, um, you can go and see all those. Okay, let me pull this up real quick. So this is the view from Lava Point, which we are just about to fly over. Or excuse me, we just passed just a minute ago. Can I see the sunset? Coming through. There was a volcano in this area a little while ago. A little while ago, he says. <laughs> Quite a while ago. Um, Maybe not cosmically, but. Okay, okay, so um, the other piece of the Colorado Plateau that's important to know, and the reason that you get these really deep canyons like the Grand Canyon or Zion, is that the layers here have gone, have undergone 5,000 to 10,000 feet of uplift starting about 66 million years ago. So this entire Colorado Plateau um, started raising out of the ground, which gave it a, an extra bit of elevation. So if you ever go up to Grand Canyon, my wife and I didn't realize this, but it's um, you may encounter snow there pretty readily because it's just so high up in the in elevation. And so we were actually driving through a snowstorm in the Grand Canyon, which we a snow fall it was a storm, um, but we uh, we did not realize that that was a potential concern. So um, so the Colorado Plateau is this area which is significantly bigger than I realized. And so we're in Utah, just over on the left here. And so you can see um, how Zion can kind of cut into here and you get the Grand Canyon's more down here. Make that slightly bigger, although I suppose you can kind of see it. So, okay, so this uplift of about 5,000 to 10,000 feet then allowed the Colorado River, at least in the Grand Canyon area, to to start cutting deeper and deeper channels um, throughout the uh, Colorado Plateau uh, region. So those, those deep channels that you get in some of these areas is because of that uplift. The other thing that happened is the Gulf of California started to open up. And so the Gulf of California is that part of um, Mexico off the west coast that just kind of uh, hangs off into the water a little bit. And there's that, that gulf there that exists. As that opened up, it allowed the water that was in the Colorado Plateau to start draining uh, to a lower elevation than it was previously. And so all of a sudden you have the Colorado Plateau is going up and there's a water uh, drainage solution that allows uh, for better, uh, better and faster runoff. And so now you get really fast, really powerful erosion in all these areas. So that's sort of the, the short version on, um, on the history of, of why the Colorado uh, Plateau is like that. So I'll reference this in, in future parks we go to, I'm sure, because it's a really important part, but um, but that's kind of the, the overview. Okay, so let me do a quick pan around here because we're at a, a beautiful part of the park. So right beneath me is Angel's Landing, which is a very famous hike. Uh, actually, I would be curious, has anyone done the Angel's Landing hike? Because this is one uh, I did not realize how, how cool, but also, um, I don't want to say ridiculous it is, uh, how involved a hike it is so what you can kind of see in the game let me do something actually real quick we're gonna kind of cheat flying singer oh flying singer there you go and there was a big sim update today so a lot of us were kind of panicking on if these things would actually work or not okay so i got in close because the um yeah so it renders just at the distance that i go 
you know, so we'll fly through here, but this is the Angel's Landing hike, goes right along here, which I did not understand until I was flying around this park. Uh, and so it kind of juts out, and so the actual hike itself looks like that. And then there's a, a chain and a trail that goes up to the top, uh, and then you get to see this view down the, down the canyon, uh, which it's not rendering out too far, but it looks something like that, which is a very famous view of, um, of Zion, so this is what that looks like. This would be the canyon sunset from Angel's Landing. Oh, it's going to be at sunset from Angel's Landing. Kind of do your, your back and forth on there. Emrazna, was it was it cool? So Emrazna says he went uh, when you visited five years ago. W would you recommend it? I guess would be my question. Um, I I imagine it was it was cool. Uh, okay. So there's Angel's Landing. Let me pop out of here. Keep flying this plane, and we will make our way out of the uh, canyon. I'll fly low again so we get some of these to render, and you can see the the difference as it loads up. All right, so in summary, the Grand Staircase is a way of describing the sedimentary layers of the Colorado Plateau. The staircase descends from Bryce Canyon National Park, or sorry, Bryce National Park to Zion National Park, and then to the Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, there's another of under other uh, national parks and monuments in between, because it's a very pretty part of the country. Let me see. Uh, Wad Miss Mad Wisman Girl says, yes, it's worth the walk. Okay, cool. Angel's Landing, put it on your list. Uh, that in the East Mesa uh, head trail, if you want to recreate the, the photo I have from there, um, which is pretty fun. Okay, M. Rosno says, it's a super cool hike, uh, although you're holding onto chains for the upper section. Um, so as you walk up, you have to be using chains. Um, and so it's not for people who are afraid of heights. I could believe that, yeah. Especially knowing that it kind of comes out on a, a sort of fin. It's a very different sort of experience than I understood. Okay, so Grand Staircase. This whole viewing layers as having a greater meaning idea, I really liked, and I don't exactly know why, but it's something about just describing a layered thing as a Grand Staircase. Um, and I know that the size of this is an important part, but like even that idea is really cool. And so um, I started looking around and seeing some, some things around the house and saying, okay, well, I could describe this as having layers, right? If I was boring, that'd be fine. But I could also describe it as a grand staircase, you know? Like, doesn't this sound amazing? <clears throat> For dinner, we will be having a grand staircase of crust, pepperoni, cheese, and tomato paste. Much better than just a pizza, right? <laughs> grand staircase. Give it a try, I promise you, it's it's a good feeling. All right. <laughs> Thanks. So Fractal's posted up some of the links. Uh, thank you very much as we make our way out of the park and off to uh, the nearby wilderness area. Uh, oh, see the other guy, you saw condors flying in the area when you went. That's so cool. That was one of the other topics I was looking at was um, California condors. They did a big reintroduction here. Um, it turns out California condors are really good for Pinnacles National Park, so a uh, little spoiler, that's probably probably the topic when we go there. All right, so we have about five minutes here. I'll do just a, a quick second for a person of the week, and this week we're talking about Horace Albright. So this is what Horace Albright, this is who that is. Mad Wisman Girl, seven layer salad is a grand salad. That's so much better than my joke. Uh, that's good. That's good. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is uh, this is Horace Albright um, when he's behind a desk. But really, this is Horace Albright. So this is a picture of him having a bear dinner when he was in Yellowstone. And this is him. Uh, oops, excuse me. Oh, there's another photo of him feeding a deer. I really can find it. Yeah. There you go. That would be a superintendent of Yellowstone. So why this person for this park? Uh, in 1918, the acting director of the newly created National Park Service, Horace Albright, drafted a proposal to enlarge the existing monument and change the park name to Zion National Park, or Zion National Monument, excuse me. Zion being the term used by the Mormons. The 
historical element here is, is interesting to know. So there's a historian, Hall uh, Rothman, who says the name change played to the pre uh, uh, prevalent, prevalent bias of the time. Many believe that Spanish and Indians names would deter visitors who, if they could not pronounce the name of the place, would not bother to visit it. So the new name Zion had a greater appeal to an ethnocentric audience. It's kind of a good reminder that sometimes these these places have have more have historic names and, and importance to the the local local people. Um, but that's where the name Zion comes from. It's uh, it was a rebranding that um, Horace Albright played for. So uh, Horace was a uh, American conservant cons conservation excuse me from 1890 to 1987 is when he lived. He graduated from uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and then got a law degree in Georgetown University. He then worked uh, in a number of different positions around the National Park Service as it was being formed, until eventually becoming the uh, assistant to uh, the superintendent, of the, I'm sorry, to the um, uh, director of the National Park Service, um, St uh, Stephen Mather. And then when Mather became ill, he stepped in as acting director of, oops, let me flip out of this video. Out of the things so you can actually see the the park as we leave. We'll go that way. Um, so he uh, stepped in as acting director, and then he was acting superintendent of Yellowstone, Yosemite for a little while, uh, and then became the second director of the National Park Service, which he held that post from 1929 to 1933. All right, fractals, you got that? Uh, you want to post up that poll for our next uh, next park here? Emma Rosner, you just saw them at Pinnacles last weekend. <laughs> That's so cool. You saw the the condors? Did you see them flying? Like, actually, I don't know. I guess when people say see them, they mean see them in real life. In my imagination, it's like, I don't know, a nest or something. But that's so cool. Um, I was researching other people vote on a park for next time. So there's three different parks all in Alaska. Uh, Lake Clark National Park, Denali National Park, and uh, Katmai National Park. I don't know if I have that pronunciation right. It's good for a second. Uh, Emerald, I was actually looking at planning a flight that would go uh, along uh, a flight in real life uh, along uh, parts of California, and one of the options was to fly over Pinnacles National Park. Um, but in the uh, planning materials, they have a little um, warning that if you fly, if you fly over the park, you have to fly above. I think it's like three thousand feet above the park or something, which is a little higher than a normal national park uh, because of the condor nesting. A cool way to learn about that. All right. What's the word on this one, fractals? And wow. Well, okay. M. Rosno says, "Yeah, we saw probably ten or so condors either flying or nested in, in the cliffs. Uh, once we got super close, uh, so we could actually see the size. Wow, that's cool. Well, uh, when we go to Pinnacles, that'll be a that'll be a fun one." If you have any good photos, you should post them up. Uh, okay, we have a tie. Oh, the link, okay, <laughs> Fractal still left the, the vote up, okay. <laughs> Sounds good, thanks Fractals. Um, well, people vote on that. So today we talked about Zion National Park, we talked about tunnels. We talked a little bit about um, the Grand Staircase and the related parks around there. And then we finished talking about Horace Albright. Touching a bunch of different topics today. Uh, Fractals posted up that survey in the chat. Um, I love the input on the stream. Anything you'd like to see uh, improve, change for future weeks, please let me know. Um, if you want to come hang out in the Discord community, we talk about national parks. Um, it's a good time. Uh, just kind of hanging out, talking about Microsoft Flight Simulator, that sort of thing. And let's see. Oh, okay. Nublado Dos Tres is saying that it uh, it isn't taking her vote. There you go. Hey, a flying singer. Oop, okay, bye, flying singer. <laughs> um, <laughs> fractals at IDK, I don't trust it. Okay, well, we will, um, that will be a good one to look into next week is what other options we have for, um, for straw poles. It's so handy, though. Yeah. All right, fractals, you want to break the, uh, the uh, sort of tie or new blood dose trace? You want to just post your vote? Anybody else wants to post theirs? That's fine too. 
anticipation is. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. That's two votes for Denali then. So <laughs> why don't we do Denali? So Fractals doesn't need to, to uh, be the tiebreaker. All right. Awesome. So I'm very excited to explore Denali National Park with you then next week. Uh, that'll be a really good time. With that, thank you for being my co-pilot today. Until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. See y'all next week.